from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'd like to uh, begin this introduction by telling you I'm only, I've only been at the Washington Post for about a year. About a year and a half ago, I found myself rather uncomfortably between jobs. And then I got a phone call inviting me to talk to the Post. And for anybody in journalism, a call from the Washington Post is a pretty exhilarating thing. And the reason is because the Washington Post is or has been home to a pantheon of journalism deities. What draws a journalist to the Post is the chance to work alongside people like Dan Balls and Haynes Johnson. These guys pretty much define the craft. Their political journalism is the standard by which others' work is measured. The nuance, insight, balance, and sense of history they display in their reporting lifts it above just about everyone else's. And can you imagine a more compelling story for their skills than the remarkable campaign that ended last November with Barack Obama's election? Both major parties started with unusually large fields of candidates. Conventional wisdom was upended virtually every week. And the campaigns took place against a backdrop of war, a deeply un unpopular incumbent presidency, and a crescendoing economic crisis. The book they wrote, The Battle for America 2008, The Story of an Extraordinary Election, was described by Time Magazine as, quote, an insightful portrait of one of the most dramatic and consequential elections of modern times. It's an engaging, highly readable reminder of the astonishing odds Barack Obama faced and the many interesting obstacles Senator McCain faced in winning his party's nomination. This tent is the biography and history tent, and you'll hear a bit of both. Haynes Johnson is a New York native, graduate of the University of Missouri, got a graduate degree then from University of Wisconsin, began his newspaper reporting career in 1956 in Wilmington, just up the Amtrak line, joined the Washington Evening Star where he worked 12 years and won a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting for his coverage of the civil rights crisis, joined the Washington Post in 1969, serving as national correspondent and assistant managing editor and finally as national affairs columnist. He's written or edited 16 books, which is an astonishing thing, and since 1998 has served as the night chair in journalism at the University of Maryland. Dan Bals, an Illinois native and a University of Illinois graduate, started his career at the, Nas at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the National Journal before joining the Washington Post in 1978. He's been national editor, political editor, White House correspondent, and he was based at one point in Texas. He's done just about everything. He's co-authored a book with Ron Brownstein of the Los Angeles Times in 1996 called Storming the Gates, Protest Politics and the Republican Revival. And he now serves as sort of a, the eminence grise of the political reporting establishment at the Washington Post. I'm delighted they're both here, and I hope you are too. And please join me in welcoming them to this stage. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marcus. That was lovely, and we really appreciate it. And I also thank all of you for coming out on this gray day. I've been this here before at these festivals, and every time I come, it makes me feel good, whether it's rain or shine or doesn't matter. People are here paying serious attention to serious questions, and that's great at a time of great distress in the country. It makes me feel good about the future and about you, so thank you. I applaud you for being here. I want to tell you about the book that Dan and I wrote. Usually writers will tell you how agonizing it was and you know the difficulties of collaboration and all the rest. But frankly, this was a joy. We love this story. We were privileged to do it. You'll hear more about it. But I also want to tell you why we did it and what we hope to achieve. Actually, it began, the idea began in, in 2006 before, two years before the election. And I was looking ahead to the next election and what might happen in the way of a book. Uh, Teddy White was a friend of mine. I didn't want to do another Teddy White book. He was in his own class and he was kind of a romantic about politics. I don't feel romantic about politics these days. Uh, but, but I am fascinated by it. And it seemed to me that for a lot of reasons, the election of 2008 had in it elements that were quite historic. The country was in trouble. Everybody knew it. It didn't matter where you went. 
whether it was Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative, moderate or the rest, urban or rural, everybody felt the United States was in difficult times and we seemed to be sinking. Our prestige abroad had diminished to where I had not seen in my lifetime. You had an election that was wide open for the first time in 50 years. No president was seeking to succeed himself. No vice president was seeking to succeed the president. And then you had the backdrop of a series of critical issues. The two wars going on, both terribly unpopular. They're both still with us, as we know. We can talk about that. And they are not over by any means. You had the, the situation that the people believed that our political system was broken. That no matter where you turn, you didn't know where leadership was going to come. And then you had this extraordinary background of a range of really fascinating potentials in our history. The first real possibility for a woman president. The first real possibility, although unlikely as it might seem at the time, of the first African American president. You had a throwback to the Vietnam era, John McCain, the hero, the prisoner of war. And then you had a whole cast of other people succeeding to the presidency. So no matter what happened, it struck me that this would be a great story, story to try to capture. And more important, it was clear that something in the background was ticking away. The economy was in trouble. It had not been declared to be in a recession, although it actually did take place officially in December that year, a year before the election, and wasn't formally named as such until almost before the election. So you had a time bomb, a ticking going on, a collapse of the economy. All of these elements were taking place. And that's the story that I thought was worthy of trying to do it. And I'll let my colleague and friend, I want to say, this could not have been done without a great reporter and great friend, Dan Balls. So I want to turn it over to Dan and let him pick up a story. Thank you all. Thank you, Haynes. Haynes, as always, is very generous. People say, what was this collaboration like? I say it was horrible. Haynes is so difficult to work with. You get a sense of that. Uh, this was a fabulous collaboration. Uh, thank you, Marcus. It's nice to be introduced by the boss. Um, and uh, he's been a terrific new addition as our executive editor, so we're very happy at the Post under his leadership. Um, I want to pick up one piece of what Haynes was talking about, which was how this came together. Um, Haynes called me in early 2007 and uh, out of the blue and just said, I'd like to get together with you. I have something I want to talk to you about. And uh, we agreed that we would have breakfast together the following morning to talk about whatever was on Haynes's mind. I went home that night and I said to my wife, Nancy, I said, well, Haynes called today and he wants to get together to talk about something tomorrow. And without missing a beat, she said, well, if it's about a book, just say yes. And in fact, it was about a book. Haynes outlined that morning over breakfast uh, his concept, his idea that this was, a, this was a year, this was an election, this was a moment in the country's history that deserved a book. We knew that this campaign would be covered minutely, as all recent campaigns have been, but it was his sense that because of where the country was uh, and because we were at a potential pivot point, uh, that this was a book worth doing. And I listened to him, I heard him out, and I said, Haynes, it's really interesting that you would give me a call about this because I am two-thirds of the way through a book proposal of my own for the exact same book. <laughs> we talked about it that morning, and we talked about it for some time, and we decided that the two of us together would be able to produce a better book than either of us individually. Um, the division of labor on this book was pretty obvious. Haynes, throughout his career, both at the Washington Post and as an author of many, many books, uh, has brilliantly captured America at different points in its history. Uh, Haynes is the master of the mood of America. He understands voters. He understands a sense of history. He understands where the country is and where it's moving. My responsibility in this project, because I was going to be out every day on the campaign trail, was to be Mr. Inside. Uh, to get to know the candidates, to get to know their staffs, uh, and to get as much from them, both for the Washington Post and for the book. Uh, and so we teamed up. We knew this would be an interesting story. We had no idea just how interesting it was going to be. Um, one of the challenges of writing a book about an election that is covered as closely as this one was uh, is that everybody believes they know the story of what happened. 
and in many ways that's true. Um, everybody knows how this story ends. It was our challenge and our goal to try to write a book in which people would still find a sense of suspense, a sense of drama, uh, and a fair amount of new information. Uh, the new information we were able to get from interviews that we did along the way, uh, that with the uh, permission of our leadership at the Post, we were able to hold until the book came out with the understanding that the Post would have first shot at any news that was in the book. Um, and at the same time, we were talking to members of the candidate staffs, um, and we were trying to figure out ways to retell the story, in a sense, when the election was over, to pull it apart and to tell it from different angles uh, and to describe the campaign in ways that were both familiar and unfamiliar to all of you. Um, we think we accomplished that. Uh, we think we have been able to drive the narrative in a consistent way that keeps people turning through pages while bringing together some new information that we think is revealing, particularly of President Obama, and I want to get to that in a minute. At the end of the campaign, we had an interview with the president, president-elect, which was in December of 2008. It was done at the uh, president-elect's transition office in Chicago. And the first question to him was, you are a storyteller. Before you were elected, before you became a politician, you were a storyteller. He wrote the marvelous book, Dreams from My Father. You could hear his gift for language in all of his speeches. The question was, how would you tell the story of your own election? He paused for a minute, and then he said, this whole election was a novel, and I wasn't the most interesting character in it. <laughs> then he talked about John McCain, Hillary Clinton, Reverend Wright, and of course, Sarah Palin. One of the things we feel is that this is a story that is both large and small. Uh, the large story is how America elected what we describe as the most unlikely person ever to be elected President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. But within the context of that large story and the forces that were at work that brought the country to that point last November are a series of smaller stories, stories that are equally fascinating. There is the story of Hillary Clinton's early rise as a candidate and her ultimate fall uh, in Iowa. There is the story of Barack Obama's early struggle as a candidate. I mean, I think it's easy in retrospect to think of President Obama as having been on a glide path to the presidency from the moment he gave that speech in Boston at the 2004 convention, uh, and that forever after, once the sort of light went on, it never went off. The reality is, in the first months of his campaign, that went on for a number of months, he was struggling. He was having great difficulty as a candidate. We recount in the book an episode in the late spring of 2007 when Robert Gibbs, now the White House press secretary, took a trip with him to Iowa. Obama was at a low point at that time. He was unhappy with his campaign. He was unhappy with his performance. He was unhappy with most of his staff. He missed his family. He was physically exhausted. Robert Gibbs said to him that day, Senator, find one thing positive that you think about from this campaign and focus on that and forget all the rest and everything will be fine. And then Senator Obama said to Robert Gibbs, Robert, there's nothing I feel positive about at this point. Sitting at the side was Reggie Love. You probably have all seen Reggie Love next to the president for the last two years. He's the big, tall, young fellow, played basketball at Duke, lovely guy. He was sitting there working his Blackberry, first campaign he'd ever had any association with. He listens to Gibbs, he listens to Obama. He turns to Obama and he says, boss, if it's any consolation, I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> Not even that was enough for Senator Obama. He looked at Reggie, said, Reggie, Reggie it's no consolation. We tell the story of how Barack Obama came back, how he turned his campaign around. We tell the story of how Hillary Clinton, devastated after Iowa, wakes up the next morning, has a conference call with her staff at which her senior advisors are essentially tongue-tied. She finishes that call with a very curt goodbye. Thank you, she said. I've enjoyed talking with myself. <laughs> we recount the story of South Carolina, which was in many ways one of the most dramatic turning points in the campaign, a startlingly big victory by Barack Obama after a racially tinged primary that went on for several weeks in which in many ways the Obama campaign baited 
the Clinton campaign into a confrontation there uh, and won it dramatically. Uh, there is a chapter in the book, uh, if you read it, we think you'll find it quite interesting, of the conversations between Bill Clinton and Ted Kennedy. This was one of the real mini-dramas in the election of 2008. The battle for Ted Kennedy's endorsement and the often angry and contentious phone calls that went on behind the scenes during that South Carolina primary as Bill Clinton and, and Ted Kennedy discussed in very difficult terms uh, Ted Kennedy's feeling that race was being injected into the campaign and that the Clintons were somehow responsible for it and Bill Clinton's understandably anger uh, at that charge given his whole history as a politician who had sought to bring the races together. That period ending in South Carolina, the next day Caroline Kennedy endorsed and the next day uh, Ted Kennedy endorsed was in many ways the pivotal point in the, in the uh, battle for the nomination. Um, we recount, uh, in somewhat shorter terms, the survival of John McCain after his campaign imploded in 2007, and nobody, nobody gave him a chance to win. His whole strategy was, in the estimation of some of his advisors, to simply be able to exit with his head held high. And instead, he held on, he looked to New Hampshire as being his lifeline, and he was blessed by opponents who were unable to take advantage of his weaknesses one by one by one, from Mitt Romney to Fred Thompson uh, to uh, Mike Huckabee to Rudy Giuliani. None of them were able to uh, outlast or maneuver around John McCain. Um, we tell the story of what happened when Reverend Wright's tapes first surfaced and the perilous moment for Barack Obama's campaign. He told us afterwards, had he not handled that moment as well as he handled it, he probably would not have been the nominee. We talk about Hillary Clinton's return as a candidate. In the final months when it was too late, she was, in Barack Obama's terms, a terrific candidate, uh, one who battled him to the very end uh, and earned the respect of the Obama campaign. Uh, and we also tell the story of the most unlikely person to enter the stage, Sarah Palin. Um, the arrival of Sarah Palin in the 2008 campaign uh, was the gift that keeps on giving journalistically. <laughs> At the Post, we were so stunned. We were leaving Denver. Haynes and I had been in Denver, and the whole Post staff was breaking camp in Denver, and we were on our way to St. Paul for the convention there, and uh, we got the word that it might be Sarah Palin, and uh, everybody was sending blackberries to anybody we could think of to try to get confirmation. Mike Shear, who was our lead McCain reporter, got a confirmation. We, in fact, had at least two confirmations from people we generally trusted. We still didn't put it up on our website. <laughs> Joe Lieberman was sitting on Long Island on vacation. He had been, at one point, an odds-on, not, not an odds-on favorite, but certainly somebody that McCain was quite interested in. McCain called him out of courtesy to say, I've selected Sarah Palin, we're going to announce it later. His response was, gee, I don't know much about her. <laughs> Joe Biden's on the plane coming out of Colorado. Uh, the staff says to Barack Obama and Joe Biden, he's picked Sarah Palin. Joe Biden says, who's Sarah Palin? <laughs> we talk about why she was selected. Uh, it was, in many ways, a desperation act. It was a, it was a desire on McCain's part to shake up the presidential race. Uh, and in, and in fact, it worked for two weeks. They actually went ahead in the polls, and then, because of the economy and Sarah Palin's own missteps, particularly with the Katie Couric interview, the Republican ticket went downhill and the election was sealed. I want to go back, as I close, to the interview that we did with President-elect Obama, because I know there is a lot of question, as we've gone around to talk about the book, one set of questions is constant and persistent, and that is, what is going on now with President Obama and his team versus candidate Obama, uh, who seem to be uh, able to do so little wrong? And we asked him a couple of questions, and I want to quickly read to you what he had to say. Uh, the first has to do with, did the election bring an end to the Reagan era? And his answer was, no, it did not. Uh, that there were certain things, in terms of skepticism about government, that would still exist in this country despite the size of his victory. But he said, 
What we don't yet know is whether my administration and this generation of leadership is going to be able to hew to a new, more pragmatic approach that is less interested in whether we have big government or small government, but is more interested in whether we have smart, effective government. I think at this point, that is still one of the key questions on the table about the Obama administration. For many people, including some who voted for him, they are not sure where this administration is going on that question. They're waiting and watching and wondering what will happen. Finally, we asked him about Lincoln. To what extent was Lincoln a role model? Uh, and he said, look, I don't want anybody to think I'm comparing myself to Lincoln, but Lincoln was my, my favorite president. He said the one thing he thought that he really liked about Obama was he said he had an honesty and an empathy that allowed him to always be able to see the other person's point of view and sought to find the truth that is in the gap between you and me. He said the truth is out there somewhere. I don't possess it. You don't fully possess it. Our job is to listen and learn and imagine enough to be able to get to that truth. I think this is the style of leadership that Barack Obama brought to the White House after his election, and I believe that the one issue that he's grappling with now is as the country repolarized after 2008 so rapidly, whether that approach to leadership can get him through the difficult times. Thank you very much. We're happy to take questions. Just a postscript, that last interview with Obama, I really believe, I'm not trying to sell the book, I think people are going to look back on that for years to come and see, did he match up to what he hopes to do, bringing people together or not? The challenge is still there. And now we'll take your questions. I'd like to ask this question because we have on stage such uh, a great deal of experience in political reportage. Um, and I'd like you to talk a bit about uh, looking at the current uh, status of health care legislation with what happened uh, under Bill Clinton in 1993-94. Uh, 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 I spent four years of my life writing a book on the health care with Dave Broder and the Clinton case, so I know something about it, no expert. But uh, it, it, was, it, it hovers in the background from the beginning with the Obama team. They tried to unlearn, to learn the lessons of why Clinton's health care failed, and they may have learned the wrong lessons. Uh, instead of turning it over to the Congress, uh, which they did in the, in the Obama, uh, the Clintons kept it much in, the, in themselves and laid it out very, very carefully and kept it secretive and so forth. So now we're in this terrible condition. It's still not over, but it, is been, it has not been sold well, for sure. Uh, nor was the Clinton either. But I want to say one thing about health care. We have had this on our plate since 1912 with Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Jack Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, et cetera, et cetera. And we still haven't matched up to it. And I'll give a plug for one of our colleagues and friends. T.R. Reid has written a great book called The American Healthcare. It's a, a, the healing of America. And he makes the point, traveling all over the world, we are still the only industrial major society in the world that doesn't have universal health care. During the campaign, what did you find out about voter registration and the role that groups like uh, ACORN played in that effort? Well, whatever ACORN's role was, and I can't tell you exactly what role they played in terms of voter registration, in every election, uh, there are many, many organizations that undertake voter registration drives. Uh, and they often claim great success in registering voters. Uh, very often those successes are exaggerated, uh, sometimes they're real. I think the most important things that happened on voter registration in this campaign were those that were undertaken by the Obama operation, uh, rather than the independent or, or third party groups. And I say that for this reason. The Obama campaign, every presidential campaign, in addition to all of the outside groups, uh, says we are going to go out and register X million voters. Um, but the Obama campaign was, by everything I was able to, to look at, more systematic, uh, more strategic, and therefore I think more successful uh, in what they were able to do. Now, to some extent, this was a natural force at work. 
there was, beginning after the 2004 election, and particularly after Katrina, a movement away from the Republican Party. And you could see this happening even before the 2008 campaign. In any number of states, you could see registration beginning to shift, whether it was shifting from sh Republican to Democrat or from Republican to Independent or declined to state, however uh, it was done in a particular state. But the Obama campaign spent much of the summer of 2008 in the individual states looking at and figuring out how to register voters. Um, and they were, they were at this diligent. I talked to somebody in Ohio on the, it was the Sunday before the election, uh, a, a newspaper reporter from Ohio who said, the Obama campaign has been this systematic. When someone has tried to register and their registration has been rejected, the Obama campaign has gone back to them and help them to go back and register successfully. I've never heard of a campaign that's done that. Uh, so I think if you look at Pennsylvania, if you look at Florida, if you look at Colorado, if you look at Nevada, uh, all of those states had, and, and Virginia, all of those states had a shift toward the Democrats that ultimately helped to make the difference in the margin. I, I have a question about uh, Sarah Palin. When, oh, good. When, when she was, <laughs> when when she was chosen, this was a governor who had beaten uh, an incumbent governor of, in a primary. She had achieved an 80 percent approval rating in Alaska. This this was a politician of of skill by any standard, and I'm wondering how much of her implosion in the campaign is her fault, and how much was it the fault of the McCain staff mishandling her? Well, I guess everybody bears the fault so, for her implosion. But the reality was Sarah Palin was unknown, as we said, basically in the country. Yes, she was a one-term governor, not a full term of Alaska. She had support of, of the conservative writers that liked her. She was young, attractive, and so forth. Uh, but the, the reason that McCain picked her is worth yeah, noting. She, <laughs> so, OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Uh, uh, the reason, coming out of Denver, as Dan said, when we left the Democratic Convention, Obama was like this, and the McCain people knew they were doomed. They were going to lose no matter what, and they needed radically to shake up their ticket somewhere. And a woman seemed logical. They wanted to attract the disaffected Hillary voters, and here was Sarah Palin. And they got her. And they vetted her for all kinds of uh, malfeasances or corruption, none of that. What they didn't vet her was whether she should be president of the United States. And, 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 I, and, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. The fact is that she, she took off in those first two weeks, as Dan said, it was like a meteor. And then all of a sudden, she crashed at the same time the economy crashed. Uh, she crashed under the uh, Katie Couric interviews. and. By the end, by the time, the, the mid-September, it was all over. What, what do you think the future of public funding of presidential elections is based on what happened, I mean, with the amount of money that President Obama was able to raise this time? Well, I think as a result of the last three elections, the public financing system is basically kaput. Uh, and it will take a monumental effort to bring it back. Um, we saw first with George W. Bush in 2000 opting out of taking public money in the, uh, the public match in the primaries as the first step down that line. That accelerated in 2004, both with President Bush and Senator Kerry uh, doing the same thing and Howard Dean doing the same thing when he was uh, a viable candidate. Uh, in this election, in this past election, Barack Obama had indicated that if his opponent was prepared to stay within the public financing limits for the general election, he would consider doing that. Uh, but he made what everybody regards as a purely calculated political decision, given the money he was able to raise. And he raised, get this, half a billion dollars online in the course of his candidacy. Half a billion dollars. They, they did, Made, made the clear calculation they were better off to stay out of the public system than not. Once that has happened, I think there's almost no incentive for a candidate to stay in it unless there is a way to drive everybody into it. Uh, and if there is an opt-out ability, 
candidates with the capacity to raise a lot of money will opt out. We're getting the signal for two minutes, so we'll take one here very quickly. Very quickly. Um, when does the window close for the president and his health care initiative? That is, he started with the subprime housing lending uh, debacle and then the, the skip, skip Jackson issue, and now Afghanistan seems to be. At some point, each president is defined by the issues rather than him defining the issue. Uh, presidents are always defined by the issues and their own capacity to deal with them. And we said in the beginning of this project, we knew what, no, no matter who was elected president of the United States in 2008, they were going to face the most difficult kinds of issues, a complex of problems of any president since probably Roosevelt in 32, maybe Lincoln in 1860. So no matter who was in the White House, they would face these same problems. The question is how well they deal with them. Did they deal with them properly? Did they do too much? That's the next phase of the story. It's part of our history, and it's a great challenge. Uh, are we getting the signal to crash here? Two, oh, pardon? Okay. Um, in any event, uh, that's, that was a sense of what I'm going to say. You've got a great treat coming up. I see my friend Ken Burns over here, and you're going to love this. Thank you very much, everyone.